But we have one of the one of the greatest scientists in the country, I think. He's a scientist, scientist. But he has a way of talking about very scientific things in a very earthy way that you and I can... Well, if I can understand him, I figure you can understand him. His name is Tom Bearden. Tom has uh, been deeply involved in the research of uh, many of our weapon systems, our computer uh, systems for doing all their maneuvers so we don't have to send all the armies out to sea. He knows exactly what's going on in the world of science. Tom, welcome aboard. Are you there, Tom? Tom. Yes, I said thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be back. Well, I didn't have you turned on. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was glad to have you there. Tom has uh, electrified this audience over the last uh, few years uh, that we've been doing it on the Open Mind Show. I suppose, Tom, that I get more mail about you and more requests for you to come on than uh, anyone else that we've had, and we've had some um, some really good bringers in here. And well, I certainly appreciate that, Bill, and I certainly appreciate the audience writing those letters. They have written the letters. You've uh, electrified us about uh, free energy devices, about the scalar interferometers. You have a, another thing on your mind tonight. Let's get scientific. What's happening with the weather? Is it being manipulated? Is it being controlled? Or is this uh, nature doing its thing all by itself? Well, in my opinion, it's being strongly influenced uh, <clears throat> by uh, outside devices and outside means, uh, particularly the weather over North America itself. Let's get into that, because it's affected a lot of people. Lives have been lost here in the United States of America. Okay, let me, uh, to get into the thing and exactly how it's being done, and, and before I get through tonight, I want to give the audience some things they can look for in the sky and uh, see. I will give them some very specific uh, signatures uh, that they can see for themselves when this is being done. And if you see these particular signatures in the sky, you can rest assured you're looking at weather engineering uh, that's being done from far around the world, probably from the Soviet Union. I would suggest, Tom, if I may break here in just a second, that this is an important broadcast. I think it's a very important broadcast. And if you have a tape recorder handy, I would like for you to get your tape recorders rolling. And if you have a friend, I think you should call them and have them listen, listen in, because you're going to hear something tonight that will astound you. And we're rolling tapes here, Tom, but go right ahead. Okay, to start with, I'm going to have to give you just a little preparation so that you understand in, in a way what's being done and how it can be done. So let me start out with a, the very basic thing of what a scalar wave is. If you take two ordinary waves <clears throat> and you put them together 180 degrees out from each other, what you can result from that, what you can have when you get through with that, you can have a wave or a pulse in space-time itself. What you do is you squeeze space-time just like you'd squeeze a sponge rhythmically. But you do not create the normal kind of electric field and magnetic field in the wave that we normally have in our textbooks. If you do it correctly, you don't have to add just two waves. You could add ten. The thing is, as long as the vectors sum to zero, uh, very precisely, you have created a zero vector wave, and that makes it a scalar wave. Now, but vector for wave. For simple purposes, uh, for simple purposes, just look at it as if you were rhythmically squeezing a sponge and unsqueezing it. And what you're doing that to is space-time itself with this kind of wave. That's what it does. Now, <clears throat> that is really the original wave that Tesla discovered uh, back uh, shortly before the turn of the century in his Colorado experiments. Mm -hmm. Now, this kind of a wave can be easily made in the laboratory, and it can be proven to exist, and you can use it. But I want to tell you a couple of things you can do with it. If I take uh, <clears throat> something like a pencil beam radar, something that transmits a very narrow beam, uh, and if I cross two of these beams, that is, uh, two of these scalar beams, not the normal beam that you make from a normal radar, but this particular kind of beam, in the little area where they cross, <clears throat> the interference produces ordinary energy, ordinary electromagnetic waves. You can stick something in there, and you can certainly detect that. 
it looks like the normal stuff. The difference in this interference pattern is that we are now putting in the zeros and creating the non-zeros in the middle. The way we look at it with normal wave interference is we put in the energy and the out of phase interference can create the destructive zones or the zeros. We do it just backwards here. We put in the zeros and in the middle in this interference zone we create the ordinary energy. So what we're saying is with this kind of a wave, which a normal detector will not detect, you can stick an antenna right up in the middle of it if you've got a good one, and you will not see a detection on your oscilloscope. But in the interference pattern, which may be a thousand miles away or even ten thousand miles away, in that narrow area where they cross, or you can make wider beams and have a wider area, you will produce ordinary energy, ordinary electromagnetic interference zones. <clears throat> now. That really is the secret of Tesla's wireless transmission of energy at a distance. Because everything you put in on the other end comes out in that interference zone. You don't lose a single bit of it. There is no square loss involved in this process. Now... No transmission cost whatsoever. Uh, no, uh, no loss in the transmission at all. You get all of it out on the other end that you put in on this end. If you put uh, two kilowatts in this end, in the interference zone out there, you have two kilowatts of energy. But the power companies don't like that, Tom. They like to sell transmission of energy. Well, that's true. And <laughs> we've just told you how to do it without, uh, without the losses that occur in the lines. And, of course, that was Tesla's uh, wireless transmission without energy. He is the one that really discovered how to do that. You know something that I have found out, Tom? I, don't, I, I want to keep everybody up today. We've been talking about Tesla here. I have found out that a lot of people, when I talk to you, I mention Nikola Tesla. They don't know who I'm talking about. Well, that's true, and it's, it's not accidental. Uh, Nikola Tesla, of course, given a thumbnail sketch here, is the man who almost uh, single-handedly gave us the electrical 20th century. He gave us the... Uh, uh, <clears throat> multi-phase power system, the AC power system we use today. The alternating current. Right? The alternating current. He gave us the rotating field that made our motors and generators possible. He uh, invented the radio, not Marconi, which all the books have in it. The Supreme Court, 1943, overthrew the Marconi patents. And, uh, of course, Tesla. It was a Tesla apparatus that Marconi used to do his experiment. So our radio station is operating off of a Tesla apparatus. Here. That's correct. He also built the first uh, guided uh, automatons. You know, he had a guided boat that he showed and demonstrated, guided and radio controlled. And he anticipated intercontinental ballistic missiles. He also, at his death, had a paper that described a particle beam weapon, for example, which would have worked. And he had, of course, discovered a more fundamental electromagnetic wave than we've been using in our theory today. Which is that what was you the, call the what scalar I'm calling the scalar wave. He also had the death ray, and he demonstrated it. Yes. Now, my purpose here is to show that this kind of a wave can be used to do some things like influence the weather over an entire hemisphere. Okay, the way you would do this is as follows. Suppose I had two or more transmitters which were producing beams of the scalar wave energy I'm talking about, which... The beams cross over North America. They all converge and cross over uh, the United States and uh, Canada. Okay, in the interference zone, you would see <clears throat> what looks like a, a standard wave interference pattern. You would see rows of waves crossing other rows of waves. Now, as a matter of fact, that exact pattern a friend of mine and I have seen here over Huntsville, Alabama, uh, running from north to south as far as the eye could see, the clouds were divided into absolutely even rows, as if you had a plowed field in the sky. And if you turned at right angles and looked in the other direction, from horizon to horizon, you had another series of what looked like absolutely even plowed rows. I have a series of photographs of that cloud structure over Los Angeles of last week. Good. Now, if that's the formation of the thing. Now... This particular phase of the weather uh, intervention over North America started, they started adjusting this stuff in shortly before the death of Brezhnev. Now, the signatures of adjusting it in are as follows. 
What you will get when you're starting to deposit and pop out energy here and there all over, at certain nodal points where you get pretty good pop out, dump of energy, you will get low level atmospheric booms. Not the big booms, but the low level little micro booms. And you had those going in uh, Alabama, you had them going uh, down in Florida and off the coast of Florida. And at various spots throughout the country, you had these things going and reported in various articles in the paper. That's what it was. You were having dumps, sudden little cracks or dumps of energy into the atmosphere, which are making these popping sounds. The other thing that you can have them doing is you can have them being dumped into the ground, and so you can have a series of little microquakes, particularly when they're in areas where you normally don't get those things. Now, on the microquakes in the ground, you will pick them up with a seismograph. Uh, they won't look.